Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this co-hosted webinar on 5G testing for wireless devices. My name is Lindsay Welch, and I'm the Marketing Manager at TRS Rentelco, as well as the moderator for today's event. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Today's presentation um, will be recorded. A copy of the slides and a link to the video will be sent to all registrants later this week. We will hold a Q&A at the end of the webinar to keep us running on time. However, feel free to submit your questions as they come up using the question section at the bottom of your control panel. <clears throat> for those of you just joining, today's webinar is titled 5G Testing for Wireless Devices. Bruce Blay and Steve Murray from Anritsu will provide an overview of the technology, as well as present some testing challenges and solutions. But before we turn things over to Bruce and Steve, I'd like to introduce Jim Randstrom from TRS from Telco. Jim has served as the Eastern Regional Sales Director for TRS for the past 10 years. He has over 25 years of experience working for leading test equipment providers and excels at helping customers optimize their equipment procurement strategy to ensure they get the equipment they need with the financial terms that best meet their circumstances. We know there are a lot of demands on your time and we appreciate you joining us. I'll now turn the presentation over to Jim. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Ramstrom with TRS from Telco. And if you're unfamiliar with TRS, uh, we offer test equipment rentals, leases, and actually also do our own in-house financing uh, for, for your test equipment needs. Let me go to the next screen here. A little bit about TRS. Uh, we're centrally located on the grounds of DFW Airport in Dallas. Uh, we have a 120,000 square foot facility housing $400 million of test equipment uh, or about 5,000 models of test equipment. We also have a 20,000 square foot Cal Lab with over 30 of our own Caltech, so you can see in this picture here, uh, where we cal approximately 80% of our own equipment. And due to our location on the grounds of uh, DFW Airport, we can ship for next day delivery uh, right up until uh, 9 p.m. Central Time. A few reasons why it makes sense to choose TRS for your test equipment and rentals. Uh, we offer 24 seven customer care where you'll, you'll always talk to a, uh, a live person. You won't get voicemail. You'll be talking to the person who'll be helping you out with any issue you might have. Uh, we have a 99.7% equipment quality rating, which means almost 100% of the customers who get our equipment, it's in fine working order and it, it meets their needs. Uh, we also have a very knowledgeable and experienced application engineer staff. So these are the people you would be talking to when you, uh, when you call into TRS, who'll be handling your quotes and uh, get, getting those out to you and also handling your orders as you place orders with us. Um, in addition to that, we also have international coverage with offices in Canada, Mexico, India, Malaysia, and Taiwan. And now I'd like to uh, turn it over to uh, Bruce Blay from Yanritsu, their Marketing Development Manager. Hello, my name's Bruce Blay, as Jim said, I am the Market Development, I'm one of the five Market Development Managers for Yanritsu, and my position is focused on the UE repair and manufacturing market segments. Um, I'm joined this afternoon by Steve Murray, who's one of our senior senior field applications engineers and our subject matter expert for the UE device testing market segment. Uh, today's agenda, I'm going to give a really brief introduction of the Android Group Company and our 5G product portfolio. We're going to go into a quick discussion of how we got to 5G, where 5G is being deployed what 5G looks like today. We're gonna to define a couple of the frequency band terms, the device status, and then focus on some of the testing challenges primarily for the millimeter wave frequency uh, ranges. And then I'm gonna turn the session over to Steve Murray who will discuss uh, the use case of UE repair testing challenges and solutions where he'll go over some of the, the concerns the hardware and the software and deployment. 
And again, for anyone that has questions, we'll be taking questions at the end of the seminar. So for those of you that may not know that much about the history of Enritsu, we're a Japanese-based company based in Atsugi, Japan. We were, we were, we began in 1895. So we were, we've been in business for 125 years. We have almost 4,000 employees globally. Our North American manufacturing facility is, is in Morgan Hill, California. And our North American sales and marketing headquarters is in Allen, Texas. This is a quick introduction of the product portfolio we have for 5G testing that goes all the way from individual component testing for the transmitters through chipset and device R&D. Um, we have systems that are approved for certification and acceptance for both RF and protocol. And then the last segment is production tests where a lot of those are high speed, non-signaling type tests where the devices are controlled by uh, device commands. So we're gonna start off the seminar this afternoon talking about the evolution of cellular technologies. For some of us on the, on the call, we may remember 1G, that was about 1980 when the population first started receiving uh, mobile devices. In 1980, the, the, the devices were mainly permanently installed in vehicles, but in the mid 1980s, there came out, Motorola came out with a bag phone. These were analog technology or AMPS, AMPS mobile phone system. Uh, low data rate, primarily uh, focused on voice calls. In the early 90s, 2G was introduced and that transitioned from an analog technology to a digital technology. And some of the things that that allowed was a higher data rate and we had the introduction of texting or short messaging services or um, multimedia messaging services. In the early 2000s, 3G was introduced. That was where we started getting smartphones. That was our first introduction to smartphones and receiving email, web browsing, and then 4G is probably what we're most familiar with where the data rates have increased to a gigabyte. And we're now, um, along with the video and gaming and watching movies, we still have the, all of the access for the, for the uh, smartphone. And then 5G is where we are now. And uh, the big push for 5G is much higher data rates uh, and much more user use cases. So what is the, uh, this slide was designed to help us understand the differences, the primary differences between 4G and 5G. At the top of the slide, we're starting about uh, latency or delays. The latency for 4G is approximately 10 milliseconds. The latency for 5G and millimeter wave frequencies are less than a millisecond, so better than a 10 times improvement. As far as the data traffic that the networks can handle, 7.2 exabytes per month versus 50 exabytes per month for 5G in 2021. For those of you that may not be familiar with the term exabyte, that's uh, 10 to the 18th or a billion gigabytes. Uh, peak data rates, one gigabits per second for 4G, 10 times that for 5G. Available spectrum for 4G is also um, 10 times less than the 5G or three gigahertz to 30 gigahertz. And then the number of connection densities have risen from 100,000 connections uh, to a million. 5G deployments. A lot of us are just now getting familiar with 5G, but 5G was actually started in Verizon in 2017 um, as the 5G standards were still being developed. So you will notice underneath uh, the Verizon, the red Verizon sign, it says 5G TF, that's the fifth generation technical forum, fixed wireless applications at 28 gigahertz in 11 cities. It migrated quickly to South Korea where they were using, they introduced that to the, at the Winter Olympics. Russia followed with um, using 5G with the World Cup in early 2000. Verizon and AT&T launched 5G NR fixed wireless access in the millimeter wave spectrum, followed by the UK, Japan, China, and so on. 
in 2020. Uh, Japan also was using 5G at the, at the Summer Olympics. So this is a different way of saying kind of the same thing. Globally, 5G has been accepted, uh, has been deployed by over 70 operators in 40 different countries. So 5G is global. Over 381 operators in 123 countries have invested in 5G. But again, 5G is here and it's global. This slide talks a little bit about frequency band examples um, for 5G, which differ from what we're used to talking about in 4G. In 5G, you'll, the new terms are FR1 or frequency range one, also known as sub six band, and FR2 or frequency range two, also known as the millimeter wave bands. In 5G, the band numbers start with N for new radio, in 4G, the band number started at, with, with a, a B. And then over to the right, far right column, you could see the uh, frequency range one sub six bands for uh, globally. And at the bottom of the slide, you can see frequency range two or millimeter wave bands, also the uh, global deployment. If we focus a little bit on the United States operator bands of interest, um, we've isolated AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and Dish Network. Uh, for all of the carriers, the top bands are examples of the frequency range one sub six bands, the second column or the second line, the ones that have the three digit bands like uh, for AT&T N260, those are, would, uh, those apply to frequency range two or the millimeter wave bands. So in uh, 2020, right now we have 280 announced 5G devices in 15 different form factors from 71 different vendors. If you look at the chart, this, the pie chart at the bottom left of this slide, you'll see that about 38% of those are phones. And then the rest of the market segment is broken into hotspots, uh, laptops, 5G modules, customer premise equipment. Others include things like snap-on dongles, drones, robots, routers, uh, USB terminals. And you can see off to the far right, uh, 5G devices by frequency range. So we started seeing 5G devices at the beginning of 2019. In the first half of 2019, uh, the first three devices that were introduced to the market were pocket routers. The first phones were introduced um, late in the first half of 2019. And this chart shows you that there were two millimeter wave products, um, two and two mid-band products in the sub six or frequency range of one. At the end of the uh, second half of 2019, more smartphones, some customer premise equipment. And then as we went into 2020, we started seeing many, many more devices. So CPEs, customer premise equipment, FWTs, fixed wireless terminal. So, so far in 2019, about 1% of the devices being sold are 5G capable. In 2020, that rose to about 4%. And as you can see in this chart, by uh, 2025, it's being predicted that slightly less than 50% of the devices sold in North America will be 5G capable. Another term for 5G that differs from 4G is the term NSA versus SA mode. NSA is called non-standalone. SA mode is called standalone. So what's the difference between the two? And non-standalone, which is most of what's been deployed in North America currently, it requires a 4G anchor or an LTE anchor where all of the device signaling is established through a 4G connection and then the data transfers are being done through 5G. And the standalone mode, which is just starting to be deployed a little bit and will be uh, deployed you know, rapidly over the upcoming years, you'll be able to do signaling in both the 4G core and the 5G core. 
So as we introduce frequency range two, the millimeter wave frequencies, those go between 24 and 44 gigahertz. Um, those testing challenges have um, introduced some new challenges because of the high frequency range and the, and the uh, form factor of the devices. With, with 4G and all the Gs before that, uh, the antenna could be disconnected or tested separately. So you could do a cable connection and, and do the testing. With 5G, with the millimeter wave frequencies, module density, all of the RF testing has to be done over the air. So that's, that's probably the most significant difference in testing for 5G is frequency range two millimeter wave. For 5G, frequency range one sub six, very few changes to 4G. So some of the challenges with the uh, frequency range two or millimeter wave are RF or RF measurement challenges, but you have RF performance tests where you look at the differences in frequency power, air vector magnitudes, burst emissions, you have antenna calibration issues, speed of the tests, cost of the test systems, uh, signaling with beam management where you, where you do some beam steering. Off to the right, you'll see a test environment for millimeter wave. And some of these rooms or chambers can cost in excess of $100,000 just by themselves without the test equipment included in that. This part of the presentation, we're gonna talk about some of the different use cases that 5G enables. Um, there's a lot behind this uh, that allows this, but again, it's the high, you know, the low latency, high data transfer speeds, uh, uh, widened bandwidth, number of connections that can be established. And that enables some new use cases for healthcare, education, logistics, entertainment, and so on. The use case that we're focusing on for the rest of this, this webinar is device test and repair or UE repair. So this slide was meant to introduce a general reverse logistics supply chain block diagram. So what happens to devices, regardless of whether they're 4G or 5G, once they've been commercialized and sold, what happens to the devices uh, as they get returned? So why would you return a device? Some of them are dead on arrival, some of them are insurance claims or broken. Uh, people trade in phones, companies offer to buy back phones, upgrade phones. So you can see as the, the chart goes from left to right, these go from your OEM to original equipment manufacturers, as I mentioned in the first column under customer base. And then on through the carriers and retailers, mobile device distributors and different carrier programs so that when the devices have been returned and collected, they go to a collection facility where they are tested. And the rest of the seminar is, I'm gonna, this is where I turn it over to Steve Murray, one of our field application engineers and subject matter experts. He's going to introduce some of the testing challenges for the UE repair market segment, uh, introduce uh, the Android to hardware and software solutions. And then at the end of the seminar, we'll be taking questions. So I'm gonna turn this over to Steve. Thanks, Bruce. Again, my name is Steve Murray. I'm a Android 2 field applications engineer, and I've been in this business for the UE repair business for close to 10 years. So in UE repair specifically, um, let's look at some of the issues. So obviously, th this is a high volume testing requirement. So in traditional conformance testing or carrier acceptance testing, you're testing a handful of devices. Um, in UE repair testing, it's more on the order of thousands of devices. So the requirements are kind of driven by this. You need to keep the cost of test as low as possible by basically minimizing test time and complexity. And for test plans to do this, what you have to do is you need to focus on the device parameters that are expected to vary or change as devices age. Um, some examples and ge general examples are you measure things like transmitter maximum output power and modulation quality. And on the receiver side, it's pretty much specifically uh, receiver throughput at low downlink signal levels. 
You're not testing things like software, uh, the ability for the device to register, these kinds of things. You assume that they work, and if they don't, then your test fails. Um, so what are the, some of the factors to consider when to, to help you develop this cost-effective test strategy? So the first thing is, is test plans need to be designed to minimize test complexity and test times while still giving you some um, assurance that you're actually covering the device from an RF perspective. So an example is minimizing the number of bands and channels you have that, you, that you're testing. So many phones today support many, many bands, uh, but a lot of these bands overlap. So for example, if you had two overlapping bands, it might not make sense to test both bands thoroughly. In other words, like a low, medium and high channel because they're both gonna use the same RF hardware uh, for transmission and reception. Maybe you'd wanna test the low channel in one of the overlapping bands and the high channel in the, uh, in the other overlapping band. And again, the goal is, is to limit the testing to basic TX and RX testing. 5G, like 4G, has a ton of very advanced communication uh, techniques such as uh, MIMO and carry aggregation. But these aren't really tested in the U repair market due to time and complexity reasons. Also, the more of this stuff you test, the more expensive the test equipment gets because you typically need to add options, uh, both hardware and software options, uh, to be able to test these things. Unlike conformance test in 4G, everything in the UE repair market is radiated, whether it's FR1 or FR2. There is no concept really of cabled test. Um, so it's important that you have a good uh, shield box or OTA chamber uh, with uh, stable device positioning, and obviously you need uh, adequate RF performance. So obviously it's important that the box meets its minimum requirement, which is to provide sufficient RF shielding, because you don't want adjacent test stations being interfered with or interfering other tests that are happening at other at other test stations. Um, the one thing that is a bit more challenging in FR2 is that in FR1, you or in 4G testing and 2G and 3G as well, you could typically use a you could typically use a single broadband coupler to cover all frequency ranges of interest. Um, these days, FR1, you can still use a broadband antenna for FR1, but FR2 frequencies require uh, specialized antennas, and they're typically horn antennas. The final thing you need to be aware of is uh, the automated test software you choose. Everything is automated. You, these are not manual tests. Operators want to be able to have very simple operation. Basically, press a go button, test runs, and they're notified if it's passed or failed. Test engineers, on the other hand, need a bit more advanced functionality. They need to be able to automatically calculate OTA losses, need to be able to add or remove tests, bands and channels, uh, set test limits for the tests that they want to do, etc. So we're going to go over a few slides to cover the hardware side of what Enritsu offers uh, for the UV repair space. And the first thing is, is the MT-8000A uh, radio communication test set. So this is Enritsu's 5G signaling tester. Uh, this is what UV repair folks would use. We offer non-signaling testers as well, specifically the 8870, but everything in the you repair market, uh, at least to date, has been using a signaling approach where the test, the call box, effectively emulates a base station. So the phone doesn't really know it's connected to a tester. It assumes, you know, the call box looks exactly like a base station to the phone. This thing is used, the 8000 is used uh, all the way from R&D all the way up to production test. It obviously supports both sub six, which is FR1 and millimeter wave. Um, and the nice thing about it is, is, is it's modular. So customers can pick and choose which pieces they want uh, based on their test requirements without uh, overloading the box with options that aren't needed. And obviously that adds cost. So th this slide basically tells you like, okay, what can it test? And obviously it can contest the whole protocol step because it is a base station emulator. Um, so things like testing the ability for the UE to access uh, 
to decode uh, synchronization channels, to access the network, to register with the network. Certainly it's capable of all these things. In the UV repair market though, we typically just assume that works. And if it doesn't, the test fails very quickly. What we really care about from UV repair are the uh, transmit and receive parametric tests that are supported. This kind of shows you the configurability of the 8000. The, the picture you have shown here shows a fully loaded 8000. So you can see, as you can see, there's six slots in this guy. In the U repair market, you're not going to have a box with sl six slots occupied, uh, most likely. You'll have a box instead that there will only be three sl slots occupied. There'll be a control slot, slot six, the top. So that, that allows the 8000 to communicate with uh, the controlling PC. You'll have probably one baseband card in slot four, so the second from the top. And then you'll have one RF card in slot one, uh, which is used uh, to, to obviously generate the RF signals. One card can handle both FR2 and FR1. FR2 is a direct connection. In other words, you connect directly from the 8000 to an antenna inside the shield box. But for FR2, you need to use uh, the, uh, an RF converter head. And you can see there's uh, pictures of two of them. Uh, they look like little lunchbox things. And the reason that is, is that we could put the RF in the 8000 if we wanted to. But the problem is, is that the losses, even cable losses at FR2 are very high. So what you need to do is get the RF as close to the shield box antennas as possible. So what comes out of the 8000 is not a signal at a millimeter wave frequency. It's an FR2 signal, but it's at a greatly reduced frequency. That is routed to an RF converter, again, which is close to the shield box uh, and close to the shield box antennas. And the RF converter upconverts that to a millimeter wave frequency. So the RF converters, the, the, the intermediate frequency connection is not so critical. In fact, we typically recommend or specify 10 feet cables. So the 8,000 could be up to 10 feet away from uh, the shield boxes and the associated converters, and it'll work fine. It's the, the key is to keep the cabling length between the output of the converters and the FR2 antennas inside the shield box to be as small as possible. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the 8821C. And as Bruce had mentioned, typical deployments right now use NSA mode, which is non-standalone. And again, the purpose of this is that the LTE signal provides a signaling channel for the 5G signal. So the only thing that's going over 5G is data. All the signaling, in other words, please add a secondary cell at this FR2 frequency. All that information is coming from the LTE side. And the box for that that Enritsu has is the 8821C. And you, pro you probably are very familiar with this box. It's quite capable. Um, it'll cover basically any cellular standard 2G, 3G, 4G. Um, and it can do all kinds of carrier aggregation and MIMO things. The UE repair market's not really interested in those. Um, but again, the point is, is that this is what is used for the LTE anchor, for LTE parametric testing, and also for 2G, 3G, 4G testing. Now, the one thing we have to point out about the 8821C is that it's kind of offered in two models. Um, it's the same chassis for either model, uh, but there's some there's an there's a there's an there's an option that can be added to it that will basically allow the 8821C to test two phones in parallel completely independently. So we typically refer to those as a single phone 8821C or a PPM, which stands for parallel phone measurement. And the point is, is that in a single chassis, in a PPM model 8821C, you have two completely independent base station simulators. So that these can be used to test 2G, 3G, 4G on two uh, two completely separate phones. Some of our customers already have, uh, you know, an 8821C that's could be a single phone mo model. Regardless of whether you have a PPM model or a single phone model, uh, and Ritsu's automation tool known as M4 supports both. Okay, so let's talk about some of the deployment options in 
uh, the UE repair market. This is how we see our system deployed currently today. Uh, so deployment option one is for customers that only have LTE parametric testing and 5G NSA uh, parametric testing requirements, or they have 2G and 3G testing requirements, but they do them somewhere else. So what do you need for this? You need an 8821C uh, for LTE parametric parametric testing and also to provide uh, LTE anchor functionality for 5G NSA testing. You need an 8,000 for FR1 coverage. And if you're doing FR2, you also need a, a converter, a converter head. Now the 8003A that's shown there will cover three bands. It'll cover the 28 gig band, the 39 gigahertz band and the 43 gigahertz. So instead of buying three combiners or three converters, you only need one to cover those three bands and those bands are what's being deployed today. Um, you also need an OTA chamber uh, and we'll talk about that in a second and you, in, a, in a little bit and you need a control PC running M4 to orchestrate the whole system to automate the whole thing. The shield box we have there, the OTA chamber, is a TESCOM uh, 5530BP shield box. We like this shield box because it's small and inexpensive, but that doesn't mean that other that we don't support other ones. Another one of our customers uses the 5570 shield box, which is a bit bigger. Um, but again, we like this because it's relatively cheap and inexpensive. Inside this shield box are three horn antennas for FR2. There's one FR1 antenna broadband and three horn antennas located at different positions within the shield box. Which antenna is used at any given time is controlled by an external switch box that basically on a model by model basis, you tell M4 which antenna, which FR2 antenna should be used. And the reason we do this is we want to give flexibility uh, for, uh, you know, the, the, mo the, the millimeter wave antenna modules on the phones can are scattered across the surface of the phone. FR2 is highly directional. What that means is that your antenna needs to be basically staring at one of the millimeter wave uh, antenna array modules to get reasonable signal to noise ratios. So pro by providing three possible locations, uh, we give the ability to, on a, you know, on a model by model basis to choose the best uh, pseudo position for the phone without, without actually having to move it physically. Next slide. Um, okay, so now let's look at deployment option two. And this is basically the same as deployment option one, except that you're doubling up on your test capability. As you can see, you basically have two 8,000s, testing two devices completely independently. You actually have two of everything except for the 8821C. And what we're using here is a PPM, again, parallel phone measurement 8821C, where it can test two phones independently. Um, and, and I wanna stress that there is absolutely no hardware sharing on, uh, on a PPM 8821C. It really does act like two completely independent base station emulators in a single box. But again, the block diagram is basically the same. You have two PCs, you basically double up on everything except for the 8821C. And the final option is for customers that want to do more than just LTE and 5G NSA testing. In other words, they want to add 2G and 3G, wideband CDMA and GSM, for example. In this case, we also use a PPM 8821C but the difference is, is that one of the phone sides, phone one tests the 2G, 3G, 4G technologies, and the other one only is used as a 5G LTE anchor. And what switches between the two phone sides is another external switch, and this is all under M4 control, so it's all completely automated. Um, but again, the, it, 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 the, the block diagrams look very similar. 5G FR1 and LTE are combined with a combiner and they go, those run through a switch to select between, are you testing 5G NSA, which requires an LTE anchor plus FR1, obviously, or you, are you testing uh, 2G, 3G, 4G? Okay, so I've mentioned M4 a few times um, and you're probably wondering what it is or some of you might be wondering what it is and it's basically Enritsu's automation solution uh, for all of Enritsu's uh, call boxes, 8820C, 20, 20 21C, 
8,000 and also some other instruments that we're not gonna talk about. Um, it was originally developed for the U repair market. It's currently used at many U repair customers in the USA. It's also used overseas um, because some of our customers have overseas offices. Um, and it's also been used outside by other customers, not in the U repair market for automation tasks like a pre-conformance test. Uh, the good thing is, is that it's developed, maintained, and supported purely in the USA, and it's basically under uh, Enritsu, Texas's control. Uh, what are some of its features? Obviously, it provides uh, RF parametric testing support uh, for uh, 2G, 3G, 4G technologies, and additionally, in addition to uh, LTE anchor support. Um, as I mentioned, though, that in general, you can do pretty much any 3GPP test can be implemented in M4, but typically most U repair customers test basic uh, transmit receive functionality. Um, the GUI is very easy to use for operators. It's basically limited to you select a manufacturer, you select a model, and you hit the run button and wait for the test to complete. The additional controls that are available for test engineers are locked out uh, by a password. So the only things an operator can do are basically the you know, select a manufacturer model and then hit the run button. Uh, anything else uh, that's regarding setting up stations, uh, setting uh, loss factors, choosing test plans, et cetera, uh, that can only be done when the GUI is unlocked. And again, that's password protected. Now, the other thing to note is that there's also capability to implement other instruments uh, or devices in the M4. So some of our, one of our customers uses the 8862A uh, for Wi-Fi testing on devices. Uh, many, a couple of our customers implement uh, barcode scanners. So the operators, instead of, uh, you know, waiting for the device to register to provide an IMEI, they actually scan a barcode on the phone. Obviously there's facilities for RF switching and pretty much any, any piece of, any piece of instrumentation or any ancillary device um, can be integrated in M4. Obviously, it needs to provide a remote control interface, but it's all possible, and our customers do it today. Okay, so this is what M4 looks like. The best way to see M4 really is for me to do a demonstration of it, uh, but that takes time. Uh, we're happy to do it for anybody that wants to see M4 run live, but this is just a screenshot of what the M4 GUI looks like. So this is what operators and test engineers see when M4 is launched. Um, again, you know, it's running a test script is about the base, simplest thing in the world. You select a manufacturer, model, hit the run button, and wait for a pass-fail status to, to appear. Uh, there are Many, many additional features for test engineers because test engineers need to set up stations, they need to set loss factors, et cetera. One of the nice things about it is there's uh, debugging controls uh, that are again, locked for operators, but available for test engineers. And what, this, what these allow you to do is single step through a sequence, which can be very useful for debugging. Any time a test is run, a very detailed log is created and saved to disk. Um, in real time, so as the sequence is run, if anything bad happens, you have a complete record. Uh, what I showed down below is uh, some results of, or what I have highlighted is some results of LTE measurements, but that's not all that's reported. Um, you also get to see all of the skippy commands that are being sent back and forth between the box. Um, this, this isn't really a test report, it's automatically saved, but it's very useful for, uh, you know, to figure out if something goes wrong, what went wrong. Uh, as you can probably guess, uh, M4 supports uh, test reports, and we support uh, a couple, a few different formats. Uh, a lot of people uh, like Excel format, so that's either tab or uh, common separated text, uh, CSV files. Uh, so we support those. Uh, we support uh, a couple different formats of printable, uh, printable test reports. Some folks like to be able to print a test report immediately when the device fails. Um, so they can be included as the device, you know, moves out from the test station. Uh, they like to be able to just slip a test report in. Both of those are uh, possible. And you can basically tell M4, let's say you wanted to generate both. Well, you just tell M4 to generate both or five test report formats, any number of test report formats can be specified to be generated and uh, M4 will handle it for you. 
Okay, I had mentioned M4 Editor, uh, but we're going to talk about it a bit more. So what is it? M4 Editor is the tool that uh, test engineers actually use to modify M4 sequences, otherwise known as scripts. Uh, so this is how test engineers change test plans. Uh, you know, you can change which technologies are tested, what order they're tested in, what tests you're going to do, uh, what test ch uh, channels you're going to test at. Um, and there's also a very many, you know, for every script, there's uh, quite a few variables that um, are ex exported to the user um, that can be adjusted. For example, what downlink level do you want to register the device at? What downlink level do you want to start a call at? How long do you want to wait for the device to register? All these things are exposed uh, to test engineers through M4 Editor. Uh, the nice thing about it is, is that one more, sorry, yeah, it's okay. Thanks, Bruce. One up, up one more. Previous slide, please. One thing that's nice about M4 is that M4 Editor is that works hand in hand with M4 GUI. So M4 GUI can be up to actually run the test scripts and M4 Editor can be up at the same time. When you make a change in M4 Editor to the to a test script, M4 GUI automatically picks it up. So it, it is a separate tool, uh, but the tool, uh, the GUI and the editor work, uh, work together. So it's not like, they're separate tools to make it easier for maintenance purposes. It's not in actual use, it's very simple. If you make a change in M4 Editor and you have M4 GUI open, M4 GUI will notice the change and you can run immediately. Okay, thanks. So this is, again, the best way to see M4 editors is uh, for me to uh, do a live demo for you. But this is a, a screenshot of M4. So M4's concept is, is that there are many test scripts in a single file. So there's only one sequence file effectively and it's basically had, contains a number of scripts so for example here you're looking at a specific script file sequence file and we have pointed to and we're examining uh, this is a t-mobile lte fr1 fr2 test script um, so basically what this script does is you might expect is it tests both uh 5g fr1 and fr2 and lte so you can see on the left-hand side there, there are um, obviously uh, 5G and NSA uh, step groups. And then each step group has a number of steps, every possible thing you could ever think of, registration steps, starting calls, tests. And on the right-hand side, there are um, all of the bands and channels that are being tested for example, uh, th this 5G NSA. So this is, what, um, this is what's being tested here. You can add as many test channels as you want. You can add as many tests as you want. Uh, and obviously you can do things like change test limits and, and whatnot, disable, enable tests, uh, whatever you want to do. And it's very easy to use. So I think that wraps up my uh, portion of the UI repair uh, you know, uh, test case. Uh, so I'll hand it over back to Bruce. Or are we going to questions at this point? So this would be a good uh, time to take a look at the, any of the questions that have been submitted. I don't have access to those, so. Okay, so I'm, it looks like there's only one. I only see one question, and it's, uh, do you have a macro contract with Nokia International? I believe the answer is yes. So, so this this current slide just is, is a reminder that Anritsu is a uh, heavy con contributor to 5G New Radio, progress overview. Um, we are involved and in, we offer solutions in both component testing, chipset and device R&D all the way through 5G conformance testing through the 3GPP forum. Um, we're actively working with the different wireless carriers each of the wireless carriers have their own carrier acceptance program after it passes conformance. So, um, and Ritsu offers solutions and all of those. And just a reminder that we're one of the leading test monitoring solutions for anything 3GPP technology. We offer a wide range of test solutions for the mobile industry. And we have a strong focus on support and training services to help people understand and utilize our solutions to the best of their ability. So 
Jim, okay, so uh, the, uh, another question popped in. I think this is actually a duplicate. Um, so just so it's clear to everyone, um, these slides will be made available to anybody that's attended the meeting. Okay. So that concludes the enriching portion of the of the seminar. Jim, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just want to, number one, thank uh, both Bruce and Steve for a fantastic job. And I hope everybody got a lot of uh, good information out of this webinar. Um, if you want to acquire this test equipment, TRS or Intelco is in Ritsu's preferred rental partners for the UE market. There's our contact information, sales at TRS or Intelco.com. That would be for rental or lease. If you'd like to purchase the equipment directly from Ann Ritsu, of course, uh, there is Ann Ritsu's contact information, Mark on that and as well as the, uh, the phone numbers for both of us. Are there any uh, any questions that we need to field at this point? If not, that'll conclude uh, our webinar. Thank you everybody for attending and uh, hopefully we can work with you in the future. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you.